Hey troops, it's Koala here. Uh, we have hit 100,000 subscribers. So thank you. <laughs> I've been wanting one of these for a long time. Ho, 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 ho. Beautiful. We've also got a letter from Tog here, Pilot Photog on YouTube. Thank you very much. It was really fantastic to see. Now I've got to put this up. If you uh, want a link to his channel, I'll leave it down in the description below. What way round is your logo, Tog? Thank you, Tog. Gold play buttons going there. Let's make it happen, guys. Box two. Troops, it's Koala here, and welcome back to the ArmorCast channel. I hope you're doing fantastically today, and my god, this is gonna be an interesting one. The tank you're seeing on screen may one day soon take over as the face of European main battle tanks. Welcome, of course, the recently unveiled KF-51 Panther, which has taken the military world by storm after it was first seen at Rheinmetall's Eurosatory exhibition in June of this year. Now what's so special about this is that the KF-51 is a fully new main battle tank concept, something proposed to replace the Leopard 2, which has been in service for almost four and a half decades. That is almost unheard of in the modern day. All of the current generation of tanks have been serving comfortably for decades, without much in the way of real replacement efforts gaining any traction. Upgrades and modernization efforts, modifications, add-on equipment like new armor modules, optics and digitizations, active protection systems, new guns even, these have been the name of the game for main battle tanks for a generation, with very few exceptions. So when all of a sudden this completely new German main battle tank design gets unveiled, that's big news for the military community, and what a machine this is, it's absolutely gorgeous. That massive gun shroud looking, in my opinion, straight out of science fiction. There is a lot to talk about, as there rightly should be for the first new MBT design to come out of Germany since the 70s, Germany being of course one of the global leaders in the defence industry. So in today's video I want to do exactly that. Now I've held off making this video for several months now, just in order to gather as much concrete information as possible. Of course, within hours of the announcement from Rheinmetall, there were dozens of videos out about this machine from fellow military creators just repeating what had been put out by Rheinmetall or each other with a healthy dose of questionable assumptions. But instead of just jumping on the bandwagon without having anything new to say, I thought I'd wait for the conversation and the claims to settle down a bit before making my own response to this very interesting news. Now just like we did for Challenger 3 last year, I want to discuss what we know about the vehicle, its capabilities, what's new that it brings to the table. There are a lot of new technologies and design elements being incorporated into this vehicle that make it so distinct. And of course, what that means for the future of tanks and armored warfare in general. Now, personally, I'm actually a little conservative on that side of things. I don't think the KF-51 in its current state is good enough to be selected to enter mass production. I think it needs some alterations so I guess I'd better explain why. Now, as I said in the Challenger 3 video, guys, I am by no means a subject matter expert. I am not a tank crewman or a military veteran. I have worked with my country's armed forces in a limited capacity, but that doesn't give me any authority on these kinds of topics. I could call myself a journalist or historian or military analyst, but I don't want to mislead anybody. I am first and foremost a military enthusiast and a guy who researches these topics to post videos on the internet and tell stories. So please keep that in mind. This is my personal assessment of this topic for you guys who are interested to take how you wish. With that being said, let's have a look at the new Panther main battle tank. The KF-51 is an attempt to create a brand new main battle tank for the future German army, one that isn't built within the constraints of decades old designs, but is purpose designed and built for the modern and future battlefields. For several years, this has been a private venture kept under wraps by Rheinmetall, until the final product was unveiled as a demonstration piece at the company's exhibit at Eurosatory on June 13th, 2022. 
Now what this means, and this is important to keep in mind, is that unlike the Challenger 3, which we saw just over a year ago, a pre-production or pilot vehicle of a successful project that will equip the British Army, there are no plans as of making this video for the KF-51 to actually be adopted. Ryan Mattel, however, seemed pretty confident. In other words, what this is, is a prototype or a proposal, a bid by Ryan Mattel in the hopes of securing a potential contract, more comparable to the Challenger 2 LEP from July of 2020, which incidentally used the same gun. That gun is the immensely powerful Rhein Metall 130mm 52 caliber long Future Gun System, or FGS, and the message this is sending could not be clearer. It is time to step up. The 130mm smoothbore, to quote Rhein Metall, embodies a significant lethality leap in times of more sophisticated protection systems and increasing threats. This includes an effective range of more than 50% further than the current 120mm guns, though quite what this means is up to interpretation and I'll explain why in a moment. Coupled with a 50% increase in kinetic energy over standard 120mm rounds and a similar increase in size of those projectiles, the 130mm gun is expected to penetrate over 1000mm of steel equivalent composite armour about a 25% increase in penetration capacity over current generation ammunition. Many people have been saying that this is unnecessary overkill, with the current generation of 120mm Sable projectiles capable of taking out quite literally any threat on the battlefield with ease. After all, if a 120mm APFSDS round makes the enemy dead, a 130mm can't exactly make them more dead. What could be of greater importance though, and what I believe would be the primary reason for the upgrade in calibre, is the increase it brings in velocity. For the moment, the potential muzzle velocity of 130mm APFSDS projectiles is unknown, Ryan Mottol are obviously keeping that information pretty locked up, but according to European Defence Review, it could be some 15% greater than the roughly 1700 meters per second of the 120mm L55. Now that equates to roughly 2 km per second, pretty much hitting the limits for what conventional cannons can physically achieve. There are two reasons why this is important, and the first has to do with that range figure from earlier, an increase of 50%. Engagement range for the Leopard 2A7, which is defined as the range at which it can still expect acceptable hit probability on target, is around 3500 meters. Now, the maximum effective range is more like 5 kilometers, so whether Ryan Mattel are saying a 50% increase in combat range, meaning around 5.25 kilometers, or a 50% increase in maximum effective range, meaning 7.5 kilometers, is yet unknown, potentially both. At that 3,500 meter range, however, a target moving at a speed of 30 kilometers per hour will move some 16 meters in the time it takes the round to reach its target. Add 50% to that range, and an enemy tank can easily travel 5 to 6 times its own length while the projectile is in the air at that velocity, giving the tank more time to react and potentially causing the shot to miss. Increasing the muzzle velocity therefore reduces the time to target by a proportional factor, allowing the 130mm gun to shoot at tanks much farther away than the 120, with rounds taking the same amount of time to cover that larger distance, and thus maintaining, if not increasing, accuracy, while also increasing the armour penetration capacity at that longer range. A side note here from post-production Koala, Jane's published an article just this week, which I'm going to bring up at least once more, which quotes the Panther as having an engagement range of 3.5 kilometers, and lists the program's director at Rheinmetall as a source, so this is definitely credible information. That would mean that while the gun in theory can punch out much further effectively, the certified combat range of the Panther is roughly the same as that of the Leopard 2. However, this really depends on what you mean by effective range, and training documents from Rheinmetall, who build the Leopard 2's 120mm L55 gun, also give ranges of 4000m and 5000m as effective range, depending on what ammunition is being used. It's all a bit messy, and how much it matters is up for debate, with Challenger 1 having a combat range of only 1200m, yet achieving a kill at a range of over 5100 in the Gulf War, and reports coming out of Ukraine suggesting that a T-64B from the 1980s may have over doubled that record. Though this claim is coming from Forbes, so trust it at your peril and don't come crying to me if you look stupid on Reddit and Quora. Don't visit Quora, 
just don't. Trust me. Basically, the figure of combat range is only given as a way to shield Rheinmetall from backlash if their tanks miss a target further out than that by just sheer bad luck. They can say, well, we only promised it was effective at 3.5 kilometers. You firing at 4.2 and missing is on you. In other words, it's fine print warranty information and only a somewhat effective way to measure the tank's actual ability to hit targets at range. Anyway, where was I? The second benefit to this increased velocity, however, is potentially even more important when thinking about future wars, and that is the round's ability to slip past an enemy tank's active protection systems. Now, active protection or active defense systems are becoming more and more the norm for modern day tanks, and will likely see significant developments in the coming decades. And while soft kill systems like Stora 1 of the T90 are only useful against certain types of guided munitions like older generation anti tank missiles, and hard kill examples like the Trophy system of the Markova 4 and M1A2C, or the Russian Arena system can only intercept lower velocity projectiles like heat shells or RPGs, as well as ATGMs that can't be jammed by soft kill measures, the introduction of hard kill systems that can actually intercept armor piercing sable shells is now becoming possible. Systems like IMI's Iron Fist or Rheinmetall's own AMAP ADS already have this capability. The Russian built Afghanit system equipping its Armata platform may also be in this category, and future systems will probably delve into this capacity more regularly. The higher the velocity of the projectile is, however, the more difficult it is for the millimetric wave radar tracking of hard kill defense systems to plot its trajectory and fire a counter projectile to intercept it in time. In fact, a significantly fast projectile will likely be able to sneak through this defensive bubble without the vehicle's radar even picking it up at all. Though whether the 130mm gun can indeed push a sable round to these velocities is not yet known. Now, whether or not the 130mm gun is necessary even for this purpose is a story for another video, but for the moment it is the only serviceable weapon perhaps capable of fulfilling it. With rail guns, light gas guns and other such weapon types not likely to be available for tanks in any reasonable capacity for at least another decade or more depending on funding for their various projects. The 130mm gun is very much an evolution of the RH120, rather than a revolutionary new weapon. It looks almost identical, just slightly scaled up. But it is tried and tested, and more importantly, it's available right now. What is a more revolutionary feature for the KF-51, however, is that unlike the majority of Western-designed main battle tanks, the Panther uses an autoloader. The tank is equipped with a fully automatic ammunition handling system designed in-house by Rheinmetall, which is fed by two 10-round drums held in the rear of the turret, a very different system to the carousel-style autoloader beneath the floor of Russian and Chinese tanks, or even the cassette-style autoloader used by the Leclerc, the only Western-built MBT that does use an autoloader currently, along with the Type 10, K2 and Alte. This reduces the required crew count to three, with a commander and gunner situated in the turret, and the driver in the right side of the hull. A fourth crew member station does exist as an optionable feature, allowing for the vehicle to have a dedicated operator for drones, potentially unmanned ground vehicles, or to act as a company commander. Promotional documents from Rheinmetall show an MQ-9 Reaper drone, presumably controllable from the Panther's fourth station along with a new weapon system which we'll cover in a moment. The autoloader system used by the KF-51 achieves what Rheinmetall calls an unrivaled rate of fire, though the actual reloading rate is yet unknown, as is whether or not a crew member can manually load the gun should a problem with the autoloader arise when in combat. Now, the reduction of crew in favour of an autoloader has long been a point of contention, something that could easily fill its own video, or three, but when you look at the size of the 130mm ammunition as opposed to the existing 120mm rounds, and the fact that each round can weigh in at 40 kilograms or almost 90 pounds, the need for such a system, especially within a cramped turret, is obvious. Other weapons of the Panther include the remotely operated Natter machine gun atop the turret, chambered in 7.62mm, and a larger 12.7mm 50 cal machine gun mounted coaxially with the main cannon. 
The Natter Remote Controlled Weapon Station, which is primarily geared towards anti-drone defense, can act as a fully hands-off, automated point defense system with its own target ID systems, or as an anti-infantry weapon controlled by the crew within the turret, though its position at the rear of the turret and the height of the weapon itself may hamper it in this role. The weapon can elevate to almost vertical, but its depression angles may be quite limited, making its usefulness as an anti-personnel weapon somewhat dubious. Certainly a selling point for the new tank, however, is its other primary weapon system, a set of Hero 120 loitering munitions or suicide drones. Manufactured by Israeli defence company Uvision, this hybrid between an ATGM and a drone or UAV has a range of around 60 kilometres and a potential flight time of 60 minutes. Now this makes it capable of aerial reconnaissance and then precision strike capabilities, or being able to be recovered if a parachute is installed and quickly made ready to fly again. The Hero 120 can also install an anti-armor warhead, which like its American equivalent, the Switchblade 600, is taken from the Javelin anti-tank missile. However, unfortunately this necessitates the removal of the recovery chute, making it a single-use munition. Now, compared to a more conventional anti-tank missile, a loitering munition travels at a far slower velocity, but allows the user not only to collect valuable reconnaissance data on the terrain between them and their target, and loiter over the engagement area waiting for the ideal time to strike, but also to abort an attack until a matter of seconds before impact. The KF-51 Panther, as shown at Eurosatory, mounted a quad launcher system for the Hero 120, similar to that seen on light-wheeled vehicles at the rear of its turret, though it unfortunately has to sacrifice half its internal ammunition storage for the main gun in this configuration. This could allow the vehicle's crew to access two recoverable munitions for reconnaissance and the potential light precision strike capabilities, while the second pair contain the heavier tandem charge warhead of the Javelin, which has proven highly effective on the battlefields of Ukraine in 2022. To me, however, this is not the kind of system that belongs on a main battle tank. In fact, I think it's quite a silly idea, and I will go over why. Besides the Hero 120 munitions, the Panther can also launch two small integrated quadcopter drones named Stingers for more local reconnaissance. The protection of KF-51 is another revolutionary upgrade over previous generation main battle tanks, comprising not only the Natter system for defence against enemy UAVs and loitering munitions, but the Rheinmetall Top Attack Protection System, or TAPS, and widely renowned Strike Shield Active Defence System. Both of these are hard kill measures, detecting incoming munitions and launching counter projectiles to destroy them before they can make contact with the vehicle. Strike Shield in particular is widely regarded as the best defensive system on the market to date, with the fastest reaction time, lowest electromagnetic emissions, and least risk to nearby infantry, at least when compared to known contemporaries like the Israeli Trophy and Iron Fist, as well as Raytheon's lesser known Quick Kill system. Strike Shield, which Rheinmetall refers to as a hybrid of soft and hard kill solutions, employs the rosy smoke generation system to mask the vehicle against infrared, optical and laser guided targeting systems, including laser rangefinders. That TAPS and Strike Shield are so capable eases the requirement of onboard composite armour protection, allowing the KF-51 to maintain a combat weight of only 59 tonnes about 10 tonnes lighter than the latest Leopard 2 variants, which is phenomenal. This eases strain on the power pack as well, provides a much needed mobility boost up to 90 km per hour and 65 off-road, which is very very fast for a main battle tank, and makes the tank far more strategically and operationally mobile, able to be transported more easily, traverse bridges that could not support heavier vehicles, and fit the AMOV P4L profile, a NATO standard for rail transport. This is where the designation 51 actually comes from, denoting the first vehicle of a series in the 50 ton weight range. I've seen several misconceptions about this designation, that perhaps 51 tons is the tank's empty weight or the weight initial concepts were expected to be, uh, but this is not true. In fact, the designation is more like the German tank ammunition, which has first a series and then a type designation, such as the DM33 or 63 rounds, the 3rd and 6th iterations for the 120mm gun of the round type with the designation 3, that being the armour-piercing sable rounds. 
In this regard, DM12 is the first of type 2, which is heat, and DM38 and 48 are the third and fourth training rounds, training ammunition having the type designation number 8. The designation KF51 could be read as KF51, the first number being its weight class or weight range, and the second being its series number, while the Lynx fighting vehicle family, the first vehicles of a projected series in the 40 ton weight range, get the designation KF41. Now this means that the eventual successors of the KF-41 Lynx and KF-51 Panther would receive the designations KF-42 and 52 respectively, though this would rely on a future successor to the Panther not increasing the weight at all, else it would fall into the 60 ton class and get the designation KF-61. Now this also means that ammunition for the 130mm gun should begin with a new DM-13 armor-piercing sable round, along with programmable high-explosive rounds which should be designated DM-11, unless the 130mm gun were also to bring a new ammunition designation scheme. We just don't know. As far as the armour itself of the Panther tank is concerned, it's said to be equally as good as the Leopard 2A7s, achieving weight reduction not by removing and weakening armour over its older generation counterparts, but by using newer, lighter materials in place of the bulky 1980s designed composite array. Again, I'll stress this, the KF-51 is not sacrificing armour over the Leopard 2A7. It is not a weakly armoured tank by modern standards by any means. Instead, what Ryan Mattel are doing is the same thing Mitsubishi Heavy Industries did when creating the Type 10 main battle tank for Japan, electing to match the armour of the previous generation vehicle, the Type 90 and Leopard 2A7, for a reduction in that weight, rather than improving upon their armour and maintaining weight. A side note, when we produced a YouTube short talking about the Panther, I was shocked by the number of people who looked at the turret and commented on, quote, the enormous shot trap. Now, I can reassure you that the KF-51, like the Leopard 2 before it, does not have what you'd call a shot trap. That just isn't applicable in this case. A shot trap, which was a significant problem for the Panther's World War II namesake, is when the angle of the armour plate aimed to deflect incoming rounds deflects them into what is a more vulnerable portion of the armour. For the World War II Panther, it meant the underside of the rounded gun mantlet ricocheting shells down into the thin hull roof. While I won't go too deep into the actual physics here, that just isn't how modern tanks, or more specifically modern types of ammunition, work. They don't ricochet and they don't stay intact upon impact, like World War II era conical rounds. When a modern armour-piercing sable round hits a tank's armour, should it fail to penetrate, it effectively plasticizes instantly, losing all of its penetrative force. Because of that, the idea of a shot trap just doesn't apply, as any pieces of the penetrating rod that did get flung upward or downward by angled armour would be rendered pretty well harmless, unless they should hit some nearby infantry. Uh, if you are interested in hearing some more about the different types of ammunition, by the way, you should check out this video here, link on screen and in the description. The lightweight composite armour of the Panther, coupled with the transition of many older generation analogue systems to digital software components, including the fully standardised NGVA or NATO Generic Vehicle Architecture backbone, thank you for putting an acronym in your acronym again, Ryan Mattel, though I guess NATOGVA doesn't really roll off the tongue either, mean that the KF-51, even with its large bulky turret, larger main gun, and all its defensive systems, can still achieve such a comparatively low weight versus something like the M1A2C, Leopard 2A7, and Challenger 2 and 3. Is it just me, or does the Challenger 3 look a lot less impressive right now? In fact, the hull of the KF-51 is very much based on that of the Leopard 2, and this is where some controversy and some arguments have cropped up regarding statements that the KF-51 uses the Leopard 2's hull, or is a simple modification of it, rather than a completely new design. In fact, Ryan Mattel themselves have produced somewhat conflicting information on this topic, including the fact that the KF-51's new turret is able to be easily installed onto existing Leopard 2 tank hulls as an upgrade package. And while the fact of the matter is that KMW hold licensing over the design of the Leopard 2 itself, the KF-51 as we've seen it so far 
is using a modified version of that older tank's hull for demonstration purposes and cost saving. A fair play considering that this radically revolutionary tank may not end up being bought by the German government after all. The chassis components and power pack are also modifications of existing Leopard 2 systems, including the same MTU V12 diesel engine developing 1500 horsepower, paired with the RENK transmission in use since 1983. Now, according to an article produced by Jane's in July this year though, a production KF-51 will have a fully new hull, though how much of a similarity this would bear to that of the Leopard 2 and its modification on the Panther vehicle as we've observed is obviously yet to be seen. Other than this, the KF-51 Panther is equipped with incredibly advanced sensor suites and pre-shot detection capability, allowing for such quick reactionary shooting that an enemy anti-tank missile system aiming at the Panther may find return shots coming in before he's even been able to launch that missile in the first place, painting a rather terrifying picture of this tank. Should an anti-tank team even attempt to aim smart weapons at it, the Panther's crew will know instantly where the threat is and be able to deploy smoke screens, slew the 130mm gun on target, and neutralize. All of the tank's systems are reportedly able to be controlled from each of the crew member stations, meaning that should the gunner or even commander be injured or killed while in the tank, the driver may be able to continue operating all the weapons and defensive systems of the tank from their position in the front hull though likely in a far more limited capacity. This kind of adaptability, combined with human-machine integration, paves the way, according to Ryan Mattel, for future remote turret or even fully unmanned versions of the tank, the latter perhaps also being controllable from the optional fourth station in what would become a platoon command tank, a very similar notion to what we are seeing with sixth generation fighter jet developments and the so-called loyal wingman drone systems. The overall build of the tank, with its somewhat divisive green and grey digital camouflage, I personally think it looks fantastic, is very sci-fi and futuristic looking, with that massive geometric gun shroud, likely serving to aid in cooling the barrel, allowing it to withstand rapid rates of fire and the increased explosive charges of 130mm ammunition, but also to hide the heat signature of that gun from thermal imaging systems while the armour plating itself is likely designed and shaped to minimise radar cross-section and electromagnetic signature. So, the first question I'm sure many of you will have upon looking at this tank is, why now? After all, previous attempts to replace the Abrams and Leopard 2 have existed since the 90s. In fact, the US Congress did not expect the M1 Abrams to serve beyond 1998, at least not in any primary role in the US Army. But the tanks have persisted, applying upgrade after upgrade, keeping them up to par and ahead of what the West's adversaries, namely the Russian Federation and People's Republic of China and their allies, could field against them. With the fall of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, the idea of fully replacing the Abrams and Leopard 2 with newly designed tanks, equally as revolutionary to them as they themselves were to the previous generation M60 and Leopard 1, pretty much died out, and with today's tanks having lasted so long, they've developed a love and loyalty among enthusiasts that, for some, make them seem almost impossible to think about replacing. It's, it's difficult to even imagine a world in which the M1A2 SEP Abrams and Leopard 2A7 no longer exist beyond antiquities in museums, having become too old and outdated to serve on a battlefield. The thing is that that day is going to come, and for the Challenger 2, for example, it already has, partially because the Challenger 2 is a morbidly obese pile of junk. Your favourite tank sucks on the Challenger 2, coming real soon. So, uh, the Leopard 2A7, which is the most recent variant of the tank made by KMW, has undergone recent upgrades, part of which was the installation of an active defence system, new onboard computing systems, and these become more and more difficult to integrate with a vehicle body designed in the 1970s. If you imagine, since I know many of my audience are PC gamers, trying to hook up a brand new RGB wireless keyboard and mouse with macro keys, media keys, and all the bells and whistles to an IBM business computer from the 80s. That's basically the challenge facing tank designers looking to further upgrade tanks like the Abrams and Leopard 2 now. Eventually, it just becomes inefficient cost-wise. 
A similar example actually hampered the F-22 Raptor, and is undoubtedly now responsible for its coming onto the chopping block for retirement. Though the F-22's flight computer and weapons control systems were designed in a world where the AIM-120 AMRAAM already existed, unlike say the F-15 Eagle, the design of those systems just wasn't very adaptable or future-proof. The incredible difficulty of integrating the new AIM-120D variant used by the F-35 onto the F-22, and the huge cost overruns associated with that upgrade, almost had the Raptor retired immediately, rather than it sticking around for another decade, and certainly put the final nail in the coffin of any attempt to restart F-22 production. The main problem facing any replacement effort for the Leopard and Abrams has always been the expense of designing, manufacturing and fielding a wholly new vehicle over applying relatively simple upgrades to an already mass-produced platform. The requirement of retraining troops, reorganising factories and procuring new tooling equipment, etc. Eventually, however, due to the sheer difference in systems and requirements, a lack of tooling and spare parts being manufactured, and the relative wastefulness of maintaining a design made for old redundant systems when newer options are available, inevitably tips those scales in the other direction. Now I don't have any reliable sources claiming this, but I would hazard a guess that upon working with the Leopard 2A7 to integrate upgrades like the Strike Shield APS, later swapped out for Trophy, and trying to work with new C4i systems, KMW had such trouble and potentially cost overruns that all of a sudden the idea of adopting a fully new design became less complicated and expensive than daring to think about upgrading the Leopard 2 again, perhaps to a Leopard 2A8 variant. A lack of spare parts and tooling have proven huge issues for the German Army's combat readiness numbers already, resulting in over half its Leopard 2 fleet either being unable to be made combat capable or being straight up cannibalised to keep the other half in working order. Another significant issue when integrating things like active protection systems and their associated radars, battlefield management and C4I systems, and especially the modern idea of drone control etc, is power generation, data link, and in particular a very important consideration that didn't exist for the Leopard 2, is cybersecurity. Now if you combine all this with the desirability for greater firepower and the necessity of an autoloader to account for that increased weight of larger diameter shells, what you effectively have is a new tank already anyway. But that doesn't mean at all that the existing design itself is no good or no longer relevant. The Leopard 2, contrary to what I've said in the past, isn't broken or outmoded by any means. It is still among the most powerful and capable and well-designed tanks in service, so keeping what still works, such as the chassis and suspension components, power pack, and general design language and layout, just makes adoption and retraining on the new vehicle that much less of a hassle. Hence why the KF-51 Panther is so reminiscent of the Leopard 2A7 overall. Now, it can also make the court of public opinion a little more favourable when, like I said, the current generation of these tanks is so well-loved if the new does look a little like a descendant of the old, you'd be surprised how much that matters, particularly insofar as what's called the military-industrial complex. If a political party or local representative thinks they can sway voters by downplaying the rubbish, fragile, overly expensive new design that the government wants to waste your money on, and advocating for the tried-and-true good old platform we know and love, the manufacturer of the new machine are going to be faced with a lot of trouble, making things more time consuming and expensive, which just further solidifies the public's disdain for the new vehicle in a self-fulfilling cycle. Something I'll call the F-35 syndrome. Lightning syndrome? What sounds better? You decide. In that regard, perhaps the only reason the KF-51 Panther isn't being called the Leopard 3 is because it isn't KMW, Krausma 5 Eggman, who are building it, but Rheinmetall, who obviously want to associate it with their own company's products, like the KF-41 Lynx. The second question I've seen people asking, particularly on our Discord, which is open to all Patreon supporters, you should come join, link below, is why the KF-51 has not made use of an unmanned turret, like the T-14 Armata which many claim the Panther is a direct response to, NATO needing to keep ahead of Russia's latest designs, or the new Abrams X from General Dynamics. 
Well, first of all, Ryan Mattel did make very clear that when a new chassis is adopted, should the KF-51 be ordered into production, which they seem confident of, a version with an unmanned turret and three crew members in the new hull is very much a possibility, while not being possible as of yet when the vehicle is so far mostly a turret strapped onto a modified Leopard 2 hull for demonstration and marketing purposes. The thing is though that I would question just how valuable this really is, and I do plan on making a dedicated video about this. To sum it up here however, NATO's tanks, at least since the 70s and 80s, have all had a very clear design language, that being a very strongly armoured turret and much weaker hull. The idea being that not only should the vehicles be used from hull down positions, only showing enough of the turret to lay the gun and not presenting the hull as a target at all, but due to the ranges at which modern tanks would be expected to engage, most shots from enemy tanks would be coming down onto the turret anyway, necessitating more armour there than on the hull. To put all the crew into the hull and use an unmanned turret requires basically flipping that around, meaning a radical rethinking of how tanks are designed and laid out from the get-go, otherwise risking huge wastefulness and jeopardising the safety of all crew members by armouring the area with nobody in it and leaving the crew compartment with less protection. However, the alternative means losing the armour on the area that is most likely to be hit, especially if, as is the point of an unmanned turret, the tank is being used hull down, making a mission kill of the tank by hitting its turret and disabling its fighting ability that much easier and more likely, in turn completely removing the benefit of being hull down at all. This is something the T-14 Armata will very much have to deal with, that turret is not well armoured. Sure, the crew are safe, which is the most important factor absolutely, but the tank is, statistically speaking, less effective overall. The other major consideration is that the most significant dangers to tanks in a modern battlefield environment are not enemy tanks and anti-tank guns, but top attack anti-tank missiles and drones, or landmines and IEDs, both of which point towards lessening the armour on the turret and placing 100% of your soft squishy humans in the hull of the vehicle, where they also can't see out nearly as well, being a bad idea. In fact, of all the Abrams tanks destroyed in Iraq, every single one that was not a victim of friendly fire was scuttled by its crew after damage from landmines, while not a single one was put out of action by Iraqi tanks or AT guns. When it comes down to it, I just do not see the draw for NATO main battle tanks to adopt unmanned turrets, and I don't believe they are really all they're cracked up to be, as they put the gunner and commander of the tank in the same danger as the driver should an IED or mine go off under the vehicle. And we can talk about this more when we cover the Abrams X very soon, and as I said, I will cover this idea in its own video, but suffice it to say, I think Ryan Mattel made the right decision when it comes to the Panther's crew layout. When it comes to the weapon systems of the KF-51, however, I can see several minor and a couple of major issues, such as the low ammunition capacity, and some odd choices when it comes to the Panther's secondary and auxiliary weapon systems. However, since this video has been going on long enough already, what I'm going to do is talk about those problems in a separate episode, which should come out very soon. The bottom line is that I would treat this similarly to any other concept or technology demonstrator vehicle, and not expect it to enter mass production or service as it is in its current form, without certain alterations and fixes. Like Rheinmetall's former Lynx fighting vehicle, which saw numerous changes made between its first unveiling in 2016 and its first purchase efforts in 2020, the KF-51, if desired by the German government for the Bundeswehr, will undergo rigorous testing and it's likely that some alterations will be requested for the final product. Lads and lasses, what has been presented to us here is without a doubt a powerful new face in tank design, not just adding on as an afterthought, but integrating into the design things like layered active defence systems, digital architecture and cyber protection, while bringing increased lethality and maintaining or even improving strategic, operational and tactical mobility. As Rheinmetall's first main battle tank design, the KF-51 Panther, should it enter service today, would be, without a shred of doubt, the most powerful and in many ways most capable tank ever made, just with perhaps a few design missteps that make it ergonomically difficult to use. 
And while I have just expressed doubts about its likelihood of entering service, at least in its current form, I am quietly confident that the time of new generation tanks being adopted to replace the current is indeed on the horizon, and that the dynasty of the M1 Abrams and Leopard 2 is coming to an end. What that means for the export market, however, is anyone's guess, and will depend on factors like unit cost and availability, and whether or not it's even considered necessary, perhaps driving Rheinmetall to create a variant at least of the Panther with the existing 120mm L55 gun as an interim solution. Obviously, as mentioned earlier, there is the ability to place the Panther turret onto any existing Leopard 2 hull as a sort of middle ground upgrade package, and this is something that export customers such as Denmark, Poland, Hungary or Switzerland may be interested in. Actually, just last week, Jane's published a quote from the KF-51 programs director at Rheinmetall, Alexander Kurt, stating that he expressed confidence in the Panther's prospect on a NATO market, and that the European Defence Agency had estimated 500 to 800 or more vehicles to be produced for the export market by 2035, including upgrades growing to a whopping 5,000 to 8,000 MBTs after that year. And while that seems exceptionally hopeful for such a platform, that would be double the production run of the Leopard 2, which is Europe's most successful modern export tank, operating in over 15 countries' armed forces, with more than 3,500 examples made. It does show at least that Rheinmetall are confident they can meet this type of demand, while producing the Lynx and other platforms. Kurt at the same time presented a concept of a Panther air defence version with an Oerlikon made Skyranger turret, though as far as I'm aware no images of this have been revealed. Since the KF-51 so far is just a turret using a modified Leopard 2 hull, calling this variant with the Skyranger system a Panther version would be strange. Unless, of course, that in-house Rheinmetall-made hull was also shown to Jane's last week. It actually could be this vehicle here. Anyway, with that, I'm going to leave you for today. Lads and lasses, I really hope you've enjoyed this look at Rheinmetall's KF-51 Panther main battle tank concept, and that you'll let me know what you think in the comments section down below, as well as what you thought of this video. As I said, I am keen on discussing what I personally perceive as some negatives or at least some strange choices Ryan Mattel have made, in my opinion, when it comes to the Panther, particularly centering around that Hero 120 drone, which I honestly doubt most users of the tank, if it is to receive that projected export success, would actually pursue. I would have spoken about that here, I don't like splitting videos like this into parts, but this episode was getting more than long enough as is and I am very much keen to get it out since we've been away for a long period of time. Now on that front, I won't waste your time talking about why that is here, I may do another time, but I do want to say that we are definitely back now and uh, give a huge thanks to our Patreon supporters who stuck with the channel during its second major break. Uh, other than that, a massive thank you for 100,000 subscribers. I hope once again that you've enjoyed, have a great day, and I'll catch you all on the battlefield. Thank you to all our supporters on Patreon for making this video possible, with a special thanks to Mo, Ian Anderson, Universe, Dean Winger, Tsukoshi Tiger, Captain Fubar, Dragon of the West, and Dagger68. If you like this video, I hope you subscribe and check out our other content, and if you really like what we do here, and you want to check out some more outtakes and extras like what you're seeing in the background right now, then consider supporting the channel on Patreon, and thanks for watching. I've used a webcam. I don't know how to do a proper face recording, as you can see by the fact that I've literally moved out the shot so that our logo isn't visible in the PC. It was 300 bucks that cost me. I know it was a bad financial decision, wasn't it? It was really fantastic to see. Now I've got to put this up. If you uh, want a link to his channel, I'll leave it down in the description below. What way around does your logo tug? Is it like the Antichrist if I put this up in the wrong way? I should probably work that out, actually, before I do something really horrible and put it upside down. If anyone else has anything they want to send me, by the way, uh, feel free to let me know in the comments. Uh, I'll maybe start a PO box if enough people have anything they want to send. I'm probably not a large enough creator for that to be a thing yet, but uh, if any of you want to send a novelty item or anything, let me know that the desire's there and I'll 
I'll do something about it. Excellent. That man has a massive penis, guys. 100,000 isn't a huge amount in the grand scale of YouTube, but it's a milestone I've had in my head for over a decade, and I'm very proud to have been able to hit it now. So thank you to every one of you. Thanks to the Patreon supporters, and uh, I won't waffle on.